Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this presidential highlighted session um, on problemat problematizing measurement and evidence. I'm Radhika Gorur, and it is my privilege to chair this session. The proliferation of international standardization, quantification, and comparison in social policy is arguably one of the most significant social, cultural, and political phenomena of our times. The stakes are high. At stake are epistemological concerns about the methodologies and the accuracy and validity of the data, political concerns regarding what counts as evidence, ethical concerns about the effects of data-driven policies, particularly for equity, and philosophical and ontological concerns relating to the performativity of data and the intertwined nature of science and politics. In education, we've been actively critiquing the effects of the rise of indicators and comparisons and challenging the ability of numbers to represent the complexity of educational and social phenomena. We've been lamenting the appropriation of numbers to suit particular agendas. But we have, barring a few exceptions, largely performed this critique without challenging the categories of the technical and on the one hand and the political or the social on the other. We trouble numbers, but then we quickly move to the issue of, them, of their use and misuse. And this deflects attention from the politics and uncertainty of numbering itself, as well as the constitutive nature of representation. We often fail to remember what Bruno Latour says so, said so eloquently, that science is politics by other means. In this session, we will hear from two preeminent scholars who have engaged with these issues in depth and who are able to bring to us philosophical perspectives that have been honed over the course of many empirical and theori theoretical investigations. Theodore Porter, a historian of science and professor at UCLA, and one of the most influential figures in this field, is increasingly becoming influential in, education, in the education research community, particularly for those like me engaged in the study of international large-scale assessments, or ILSAs. For me, his trust in numbers remains a favorite for its masterful analysis of the making of objectivity and the delegation of trust to numbers. His work on the rise of statistical thinking is another landmark in this field and an invaluable resource for us in this field. More recently, he has been exploring how amb ambitions, sorry, ambitions for evidence-based practices under the neoliberal governance have uh, formed an unprecedented vulnerability to what he calls funny numbers. Thomas Popkowitz, professor at the University of Wisconsin, Madison School of Education, has been concerned with how cultural principles and practices evolve and how the systems of reason that support such practices cohere. He often takes a historical approach to understanding how things come to be as they are. Tom's work has produced rich concepts for us to exploit, such as those of the indigenous foreigner and of traveling libraries. I expect that today he will touch upon some of these concepts as he explores how commensurability is established and comparability is made possible. We are indeed privileged and honored to have such eminent speakers in this highlighted session as Tom, uh, Popkwitz, and Ted Porter. Uh, in terms of the structure of the session, each speaker will speak for about 25 minutes or so, and after that we will have um, plenty of time to engage in discussion and questions. I now invite Ted to commence his talk, and he will be followed by Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, Ted Porter. Okay, well, thanks uh, to, to you for coming. I, uh, uh, as uh, uh, she said, I'm a um, historian of science, and I in indulge in STS, science and techno technology studies, though um, um, my work has been oriented around uses of numbers and statistics uh, for most of my career in one way or another, and so um, I was a little unusual in, this, uh, in, the, in the field of history of science and being interested in all kinds of things like, well, now, uh, numbers in, in education. So I was uh, lucky enough that people who uh, who move more widely than I do found uh, me a little bit and it gave me the chance to participate in some workshops. Tom, actually, and Radhika in particular. Uh, and now I get to um, 
to participate in this session with uh, all of you. Um, so that's, uh, that's a real pleasure for me, and uh, I hope to learn something, and the work that I, you will actually, in the course of this, see a little bit about what I've been doing just recently, the book that is, you know, always just to appear and may finally do it, but, uh, and then actually I'm, I hope to make something of uses of numbers in sites like education, but to say sites like as if it were just a, you know, uh, a, it's, uh, if not uniquely, it is a very, a, a very prominent and important site, and one that I began, you know, looking into and trying to think about what I could do with really before I made real personal contact with, uh, with people who are engaged in this too. I'm obviously learning more, I'm still learning more from them than they from me. I thought I would not try to, um, you know, to, uh, uh, to, to spend, except, you know, by implication to talk about education as such, but to kind of give the perspective on number that I am working from and to point here, here and there to, uh, to bits and I'll say just a little bit about my perhaps not extremely well informed views about numbers in education at the end that I hope that in the discussion uh, this will, um, this will pr provide a, a basis for responding and I um, don't have my clicker. Do you have the clicker? Oh, are, they, are you doing it over there? Okay, so. Uh, oh, oh, there it is, yeah, okay. Right, yeah, no, good, okay, perfect. So, um, uh, so I start a little bit whimsically and yet I think that this, uh, I just want to think about indicators. I, maybe I'll just say one more thing that I, uh, in a, I, I, another of the uh, interactions that I quite valued was when somebody found me and invited me to a conference on indicators and this actually, this, this talk reflects but goes beyond a paper I wrote for this conference called The World of Indicators. That is now a book which I highly recommend and they are both interested in being constructive about indicators and different kinds of indicators as well as the limitations and the ways that indicators can, can be misleading. So anyhow, I'm going to start with this, uh, oh, anyhow, I, I, gave a, I gave a talk for them and uh, it clearly wasn't appropriate for that purpose and I tried to go excavate a little bit the sources of indicators and this uh, very funny one is, um, comes from actually from the late 18th century when Europeans in South Africa found uh, actually that the Kwa Sung had um, um, and now the, the Dutch colonists had found this bird called, which they called the indicator bird. The word indicator is first of all the muscle, which allows, uh, allows the index finger to uh, point, uh, but this indicator bird was um, a guide to honey. So here's actually, this is what a literary figure, uh, Lee Hunt, wrote when he started a journal called The Indicator in the 18. 30s, and what he says is, uh, well, anyhow, I'll just, re I'll just read this, this bit of it. There is a bird, he says, in the interior of Africa whose habits would rather seem to be the interior of fairyland, uh, but uh, they have been uh, well authenticated. It, is, it um, indicates uh, to honey hunters where the nests of the wild bees are to be found. It, is, uh, it calls them with a cheerful cry which they answer and so finding, it, uh, finding itself recognized, flies and hovers over a uh, hollow tree uh, containing, to the hollow tree containing the honey. When they are occupied in collecting it, the bird uh, fly goes to a, a fro a little distance where he often, where he observes all that passes and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the hunters when they have uh, 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 helped themselves uh, take care to leave him uh, his portion of the food. This is the, uh, uh, the cuculus indicator, Linnaeus described otherwise known as the Moroc beef cuckoo and so on. They call it cuckoo actually because it also has a characteristic of leaving its eggs in the nests of other birds, but in fact was not a cuckoo at all. But the indicator that this strange, th this strange bird should actually lead people to honey seemed, seems very weird to everybody and when I found this old site I didn't believe it, but it is in fact certified still by, uh, you know, by the, um, database of birds, the other base, so there it is, and uh, this uh, literary figure thought it was analogous to what he was doing because he wanted his literary miscellany to guide people to those honeyed nuggets of, uh, of literary brilliance that, uh, that rather, that is, it was a collection of things rather than any particular thing. Uh, and the indicator, um, um, you know, so uh, the, uh, uh, 
taxonomists uh, go after it, and people want to see what exactly what exactly it goes on. It gets in, it gets tangled up in a uh, a bit of a um, oh a competition about or a struggle about what's appropriate to do with this bird. The those who got their honey from the bird insisted that it, you should treat the bird decently so that they will continue to, first of all, they deserve it, and secondly, because they, uh, they deserve their meal for what they have uh, provided, but, and, if they, uh, if, and they will stop behaving that way if, uh, if they're treated badly. A, an 18th century Frenchman, and here's the English, English translation, uh, refers to um, um, his own experience of this, a particularly big uh, version of this bird, my Hottentots, he says who respect on account of the services which it rendered them, renders them, begged me to spare the bird. A new species, however, was to be added to my collection, and I killed it. So, and actually, now they're interested in what, th what this bird is actually eating. They confirm uh, that, it, uh, that it was uh, uh, feeding, it fed on honey. It also had a very tough skin, which it allowed it to resist the stings from the birds, and, uh, and uh, so on. And that indicator bird, um, Became the model. Oops, I have to, um, became the model for um, this. Um, I mean, in some sense, you know, uh, uh, unbelievable function, which was that it, where it went, was honey. So it wasn't any essential relation you think between the bird and the honey, but it in fact take, takes people to the honey, indicating its presence, and requiring certain kind of uh, you know cus cus certain kind of behavior in order to preserve this mutually be beneficial relationship the bird isn't uh, isn't able to break the honey uh, the honey um, the bird the bees nest itself another um, but okay but with no fundamental relationship another um, um, actual use of the word indicator which became very prominent for a time comes from James Watt steam engines who we moved from botany uh, or from from biology uh, to uh, to uh, uh, technology and uh, Watt uh, 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 undertook systematic programs to try to make the steam engines more efficient. He really wanted to find uh, a, some kind of a, a scope with which he could look into the engine and see what was going on in order to improve it. Um, that was, he could never get rid of the fog and so on. He kind of gave up. And finally, actually, as a second best solution, he thought, he invented this thing, which is called the indicator diagram. And actually, it um, maps out a, uh, a four-sided or a curved four-sided figure whose uh, um, the area between these lines actually indicates the amount of energy produced. And Watt eventually, actually it isn't Watt, but, but his assistant John Southern who uh, developed this and then Watt put it onto, a, um, onto, the, onto the piston so it actually produces this sort of this curved uh, rectangle. Um, but even though it, um, Watt was in a way disappointed, it was only an indicator. He couldn't see what was really happening. However, um, in fact, it was measuring the very thing he wanted. So the indicator proved to be kind of better than the thing itself in that case. And we have to allow that indicators can be, or, I mean, the indicator, the indicator function can be quite valuable, uh, is often valuable. Um, This indicator, the uses of indicators, uh, reflects, however, something that goes beyond what the indicators tell us, a relationship between um, knowledge and activity, um, between knowledge and uh, action, um, that has become important uh, in uh, science, science, science and technology studies, um, um, perhaps especially in relation to experiment. Now, we're looking at it here in relation to numbers. Uh, which could be, but aren't necessarily experimental numbers. And uh, for this, I like to emphasize the role of Ian Hacking, uh, whose book, uh, Representing and, and Intervening, I have put on the slide, but also actually spent a lot of his time working on history of probability and, uh, and uses of numbers, and the way that numbers like experiments don't only um, describe the world, but are participate in remaking it. Now, in a way, for experimentation, that's, that should be self-evident uh, because uh, the experiment is producing something that doesn't happen, you know, in nature before people uh, intervene. Numbers are often taken to be descriptive, but numbers reorganize action. They produce new incentives. They also are engaged. They are participants. They are part of a process of intervention. 
And uh, that intervention can, you know, can go in the direction, in fact, in some sense, is to take a field, like, you know, a field like education and why do you measure so that you can do it better. So the number, you know, is even, it's not just accidentally, but it's consciously uh, treated as a, as a force for intervention, but it also produces incentives perhaps that, are, uh, that do not uh, direct, go in the direction that, uh, that the measurers uh, want. So it's a kind of a live system. It has its own uh, bit of autonomy, its own dynamic, and, uh, and certainly um, you can never separate the measurement process from the effects that it has. Well, the only way to do it is to isolate it uh, completely from the world, and that is not uh, what, why people measure it most of the time. Um, well, I wanna, I'm just going to run quickly. I said I would say something about the work I've been doing for a, quite a long time. I've been looking at um, um, insane asylums as site, sites for the gathering of data, and they gathered unbelievably copious data, uh, and they wanted to use this, the data in order to improve the treatment, but that was not, so they, were, they, uh, they certainly worked away at that, but they also had to do official reporting. And I think actually this combination of, let's say, scientific inquiry with bureaucratic duties would also be quite typical for much educational data that sometimes researchers can choose what they want to measure, but a lot of the measures are in fact numbers that are produced in the process of ordinary actions and interventions. And that certainly is the case for these guys. Um, now I'm actually interested above all in how, in how they studied heredity, but which, uh, which they in some way I, I claim are the place where um, human, the study of human heredity really got going and we're still where all the data was coming from in the 20th century in the age of eugenics and the, and the, and the beginning of human uh, genetics. Um, but uh, uh, looking at all these official tables, I also saw quite a lot about the, the, the tables that they, the only tables they cared about more even than heredity, and that was the tables of their success rate. Uh, were they curing their patients? Um, the short answer would be not probably so well, and the, the whole history of treatment of the insane starts off, oh, it starts off, that is to say, there is a, um, a massive growth of, uh, of uh, insane asylums in the 18, from the early in the 19th century, but really taking off in the 1830s and 1840s and 1850s, at first with massive, you know, great hopes and massive confidence, and then increasingly with, dis with in despair as the, and actually one sign of that despair or indication, as it were, of the, of the failure is that the cure rates go way down, but they are extremely interested in their cure rates, which were the validation of, the, of what they were doing. So the numbers were, and they sent them off to every year in, you know, to uh, administrators in order to demonstrate the success of their institutions. Um, but the, there were various reasons to not to be too confident of these numbers after all. I mean, one uh, is that um, the numbers were extremely high at the beginning and then they went down. And this, this, the 19th century believed in progress even more than we do. Uh, what's this about? And they were confident their architecture was better, their treatment methods were better. They said, why are the numbers going down? There must be something wrong, there must be something wrong with these numbers. Or all actually a, a related indication, as it were, of this is that the uh, uh, the, for, uh, uh, early in this, uh, in the career of these institutions, they show wonderful cure rates, and yet the population of the, that is the number of people, the size of the institutions, it just grew unbelievably, way faster than the population grew, and the population was growing fast. So it seems quite discouraging, and so actually we get, we see some um, um, very sharp critics, Isaac Ray, who was, who was interested in law and psychiatry, but also directed his own actually a, se a sequence of American institutions says it would seem as if results like these, these, these statistics could not be other, other than, otherwise than correct. He says, what could be more elemental and what, you know, more uh, true almost by definition than, uh, than data from the operation of an institution? He says, because they are but the general expression of the facts themselves, because they are but the general expression of the facts themselves, it is this very appearance of certainty which Sometimes, as in the present case, blinds us to the actual fallacy, which we, and we uh, go on accumulating and hugging our treasures of knowledge, he says. Nice little phrase, and hugging our treasures of knowledge as we fancy them until we find at last we have been ingeniously deceiving ourselves 
that was an empty show, well, substance has uh, uh, completely escaped us. So let's just look a little bit at what he's talking about. You know, I pair here the scene of de desperation, which was sometimes to be found in these institutions with the neat rows of numbers that were used to describe them. And then I'm just going to turn to a, a little closer view of this one from the retreat uh, from the, um, the Worcester Asylum in Massachusetts, the, uh, one of the classic, um, you know, progressive asylums and one with the, with, the, with, the, with the best reputation for a long time and which was very committed to the view that they were, they could and were in fact curing most of their patients. So we have this nice thing we see, but immediately um, they opened the institution. First thing that happened was lots of people who were in other, in uh, <coughs> um, prisons who were deemed to have committed a crime because they were insane, who were in poor houses who were deemed to be, you know, sufficiently deranged that they really shouldn't be just in a poor house, but, but should be getting some kind of treatment. People who had been, um, you know, deranged or whatever, insane for a long time and whom the, the um, uh, institutions declared that they were incapable, that these, were, these people had been insane so long that they couldn't cure them. So immediately, actually, the data, as it were, are separated into old cases and new cases, and the asylum directors made a great point of insisting that was, this was one of the things they insisted on most, that bring in your, bring in your patient at the first sign of, uh, of derangement, the first sign of acting peculiar. Well, that, under that system, actually, they got very nice cure rates, and eventually they, th they began wondering, as we probably do immediately, that maybe these are just, maybe these fresh patients brought in when they're barely sick would get better anyhow, and, and the institution doesn't uh, contribute anything. Well, they began worrying the, about that for a while, but for a long time they just insisted. They, so they distinguish now the patients between curable and incurable. But how do you know a patient is curable? Well, the best standard would be, I mean, it can't be quite this naked, but the best standard would be if they're cured. If they're cured, they would be curable. So they divide them into the curable and the incurable, or the new and the old, and they get rather bad results, uh, as on these tables for the old patients. You see old cases there about the about halfway down, and uh, excellent, re excellent results for the new cases. And, and then, actually, if you um, if you go uh, well, here's, uh, here's uh, just if you go a little more, look a little more closely, um, you find that uh, um, 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 that they are only counting. You see these categories along the top: uh, recovered, improved, not improved dismissed because of want of room and died. And you will find that um, the only way you could get onto the list of uh, not cured, that is say of failures for the institution, it's not enough that uh, the treatment didn't work for a while. They actually had to be taken from the asylum uncured. That was the point. So, uh, so if they just lingered in the asylum for decades, they would never be entered as a failure for the asylum. And even the deaths for a while uh, early on were not counted as a failure of the cure. They didn't die of insanity. They died of something else, so we shouldn't count something else against the noble rate for insanity. And on that regime, they got wonderfully high cure rates, up to 90%, or in one brief case, even 100% cure rate. Uh, though um, other places, well, now I'll just I'll show you this here, this boastful, uh, actually, it's actually a little bit earlier, but this rather boastful, um, comparison of American institutions with um, institutions from um, other uh, countries, Europe with all its, you know, learning and so on. But look at that, the Connecticut retreat, that's on the right hand column, has a rate of 80, a cure rate of 88.66%. Very, very precise. You see there, that's 11, <laughs> it's 11 cases. Uh, anyhow, um, and, uh, and, and which it comp compares better than the old retreat at York, which was the great model of a institution better even than this, uh, another, uh, maybe I shouldn't say huckster, but a, a, a guy with a private asylum called Dr. Burroughs who got over 91%, but pretty soon actually uh, uh, the U.S., uh, these, uh, uh, the Connecticut retreat and the Worcester Asylum and the one in, Massa in Ohio actually got higher rates even than that, though they did it with their special way of counting. And Europeans like, uh, like uh, in, at Siegburg, the classic old uh, uh, asylum in Western Germany near um, uh, near Cologne, um, they uh, the guys said, "Well, these, these Americans, they, they, besides the funny way of calculating, they let their patients out before they really cured." And actually, the, the kind of the last little episode in this story is one of the American asylums uh, directors, whose name was um, um, per, uh, Pliny 
Pearl, who had uh, you know boasted of his cure rates for a long time, uh, you know at later in his career, disappointed by the terrible fall off of cures, began wondering why this why this had been so bad, and uh, went back through uh, old records, including his own, and he admitted that among his own patients, he, uh, one of his one of his one of his pa patients, he had uh, credited that she, you know, been discharged, cured. She came back, she was discharged, cured. She came back, she was dis discharged, improved. She came back, so all these, in fact, there were many repetitions, and some of them, so this, one of these patients was responsible for 40, 40 cures and, uh, and 15 improvements uh, over the course of her life. So what do you do about that? Is that really legitimate? Some defended that, most thought, well, it can't really be, right? But you see all the manipulation, the, what the raw data that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, um, 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 that seem like they can't be true, in fact, require lots of manipulation, or at least uh, tolerate lots of manipulation in, in order to um, um, in order to produce these results. Now we seem to have okay. What's going to be okay? What's that? Uh, well, it's something. It's no internet. It says. Good. Um, okay, I'll just, I think probably it'll, um, skip by that quotation. Here's a, here, now we get to something more like what we, uh, what we really know of it then. Ind indicators, 1920s, after the First World War. Um, um, uh, Herbert Hoover, as Commerce Secretary, thinks that we can avoid, I mean, post-war, post even, even before the Great Depression, the post-First post, post -first World War was a time of, of all kinds of economic turbulence and real problems. Is there some way we can deal with this? We don't want it's the Soviet Union, or is it Russia? Russia has just had its revolution to become the Soviet Union. They certainly don't want to do that. Can, so can he organize all these, you know, super rational big businessmen in order to um, avoid uh, such a such fall offs in the future, and they began creating now under the name of indicators and in indexes of indicators. Uh, and actually, Mar Mary Morgan, a wonderful historian of economics and economic historian, taught me almost everything I know about this one. And you can't really read that graph, I know, but actually, what the point is actually they've divided. They have they have all kinds of all kinds of quantities that are you know produced in e in uh, e economic life, and they graph them all, and the ones that seem to rise first become leading indicators. And in fact, uh, um, as qua indicators, they are quite peculiar in the sense, I'm not going to do this, but if I read the, the, the sorts of things that are in the leading indicator, they are utterly in, in uh, you know, they have nothing to do with each other. They're very incoherent. It doesn't, they, their sum doesn't mean anything, or at least you would, that if it was going to mean something, that was something that would have to be discovered. Um, Except that they seem to be ahead of the game. So the businessmen now seeing that the, seeing these leading indicators, uh, this is still an ideal. See, seeing these leading indicators going up or going down could react. They're going down. You stop producing so much before you get so far. You're so far overproduced that, that you're uh, going to end up, you know, precipitating a depression. Um, well, that seemed to be working pretty well. And in 1928, the organizer of it all, Herbert Hoover, becomes president, and we all know what a success. Uh, the, the uh, privately planned economy became. Um, here's another, uh, I don't know if anybody of a certain age will recognize perhaps the misery index, which is the sum of inflation, the inflation rate and the uh, unemployment rate. Is that something that means something? Well, it actually, now, okay, so I mean, we'll just have to think about the audiences, and the last audience was supposed to be you know, rational businessmen, ra uh, rational businessmen who could uh, interpret these results. And the misery index was really not something that economists took very seriously, apart from uh, agreeing that both a high unemployment rate and a high um, 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 uh, um, uh, inflation rate was a bad thing. Uh, but uh, Reagan added them up and gave uh, one number and it took it as a condemnation of the previous policies of the Democratic. And that was, I think, uh, I think we, that, that seems to have been a pretty successful move. Um, it, uh, I mean, however, suggests to us to consider the possibility, which we find many commentators saying through all these examples and other examples, that the numbers are kind of, that these, 
you know, one number s expresses all um, uh, quantities are really something that are to, uh, you know, to convince uh, ignorant people or convince the masses, convince ordinary non-experts, and that, uh, you know, and that the, r the real experts know better and they will use the numbers for what they're worth and will, you know, and will uh, ignore them or, um, or interpret them appropriately when they don't really provide exactly what we want. Um, here's another number, which maybe is in that category. Certain uh, GDP, there, there are actually I found, I just reviewed a little bit these two books on GDP and there are two, oh, on the history of GDP and there are two more of them in the last couple of years as well and uh, they tend to be actually the, the historians come in typically as critics uh, and the people who've written these histories are some, some of them are kind of critical and one of these, one of these, the lower book, the little big number by Dirk Philipson is extremely critical of GDP and he points to all the things that it gets wrong. Uh, like that, I mean, you, the way the, as it were, the implicit interest rate, the discount rate, if you take that into account, um, an environmental effect that doesn't, that wouldn't really, that would destroy the world in 200 years, discounted at, you know, a normal sort of eight, seven, any eight, seven or eight or 10 percent uh, annually wouldn't even be a, wouldn't, wouldn't have any effect on the calculation at all. So, and there are lots of other, it doesn't measure the labor of women and does, you know, it doesn't measure public goods and so on and so on. Um, well, again, one, Id one, one idea might be, well, the GDP is a thing. It was, it was good for wartime uh, economic planning, converting a, you know, a depressed peacetime economy to a war economy d during World War II and the uh, wise you know, the e economic experts and so on, uh, other e experts can use the number for what it's worth and uh, ignore it when it's not. And that's actually what I, I kind of, from there I get to kind of my uh, last big point here that uh, uh, reliance on these quantitative rules actually, um, if they become important enough, if they become part of the system, the organized system of, uh, 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 of planning, then it's not that easy to, to be able to depart from them. That is, the experts who think they can, you know, interpret the numbers. Uh, now, if we, in, if we impose a system of uh, economic or whatever of indicators that will be automatically relied on, then you can't necessarily turn it off. So we have, you know, people wise, people who think of themselves uh, as wise, uh, speaking of the poorly educated, who will depend on these numbers, but they, in fact, will find that they can't really control them. Uh, Donald Campbell, the social psychologist, uh, actually he's, uh, he's one of the people kind of credited for this thought. I like his claim, but there are others. He says, the more any quantitative social indicator, by the way, he was a, as you many of you probably know, a very determined and very successful user of these things, and yet he was extremely skeptical or extremely critical of, the, of what could happen if they were relied on implicitly. And he says, the more any quantitative social indicator used for social decision making, um, is used for social decision making, the more subject it will be to corruption and pressures and the more it will be, uh, uh, be able to disturb and, and uh, corrupt the social processes it is intended to measure. That is, again, returning to kind of Hacking's point and the, the point I've been trying to make all the way through. The numbers become not just indicators that, uh, that may inform us and that we might interpret, they become actors in the world themselves. And his idea that is that uh, once, uh, once the numbers are used automatically, they will be, those who are subject to them will either corrupt the numbers or, uh, or, um, or reorganize their activities to make the numbers better, even if that doesn't achieve the real goals that, uh, that the people are, are, are or should be pursuing. Um, uh, reliance on numbers is often associated with the, um, the achievements of, uh, of uh, private business. Business is, you know, businessmen, or by now I guess we would say business people, but the classic line is businessmen. Whatever businesses, businesses have to pursue profits. They can't afford to do other than to rely on the data. The data uh, allow them to operate a system of, uh, of uh, massive efficiency. And uh, certainly uh, 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 to do without numbers would be, um, impossible and unthinkable, it would be impossible to uh, run the business, but the firms are also actually uh, have produced some, I mean, the rumors or the 
allegations of, you know, of, of reliance on false numbers are everywhere, and there certainly are some, of, some cases of this where they're quite well documented. The very classic form of uh, a General Motors, the form of management that General Motors uh, developed as a multi-centered firm was to leave, you know, each division to, because they know, they're, they know what they're doing best to leave each division to, to make its own decisions. Um, uh, and, uh, and to judge them by the results, the results being now accounts. Um, and, um, but uh, there always is the possibility, which happens already with in private industry, of, uh, of manipulating the numbers or at least, you know, moving things in so you get the, the right numbers in the years that you want it or possibly even altering the numbers so that um, um, uh, the numbers show excellent results even though you know, they, they, they hold out for as long as possible until finally, you know, the manipulation leads to a crash. But that is the, finally the, the numbers become honest. So I think that this, um, this, the, okay, this idea of decentralizing, um, um, it, to be quite plausible, I, um, I find the kind of philosophical perspective of the oh, chemist and philosopher Michael Polanyi or F.A. Hayek, who's very well known as a, as a founding figure, of, you know, the organizer of the Montpelerin Society and a founding figure in what we, what's called, uh, what I will call neoliberalism. Um, but the use of numbers to regulate this kind of activity depends on the numbers actually, not only that the numbers could provide this kind of information, but they even are, would be strong enough to resist the, the uh, uh, effort to corrupt them. And that I think it, even businesses have not been able to do and certainly governments have not been able to do. And it is the world in which, for instance, teachers or, uh, or school administrators live as well as we try to subject uh, you know, uh, educational um, results to numbers, to use numbers either to provide systems of rewards for the schools, maybe even for the individual teachers who would have some kind of a, you know, a corrected uh, uh, you know, measure of the amount of valuable learning that they have provided to their students, um, but the incentive to alter the teaching, either to, either to go into, actually Atlanta is the famous site of the superintendent who has her teachers erasing answers on standardized tests, and eventually she, she uh, held out until she died, I think, but, but, uh, but her schools were, some of these schools were closed and the teachers were fired, uh, and they, the, the teachers there didn't see how they could do otherwise and to try to protect the schools they love so much. But, uh, but uh, that's the most naked kind of cheating, but the subtler kinds of cheating are, are perhaps the more interesting ones as, uh, as, uh, you know, these, as these measures are bent and corrupted or simply perhaps that you teach to the test as specifically as, 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 as you can in order to keep your school uh, uh, functioning. Um, it actually doesn't necessarily require a, you know, an automatic public policy in order to do that. A recent book by uh, Wendy uh, Espeland and Mi Michael Souter, uh, en Engines of Anxiety, is about law schools. And actually the force for, um, uh, of the numbers is, is in the form, it t takes the form of the, um, the US News and World Report uh, rankings of law schools, which for various reasons, I mean, US News is, is really preeminent. It's the only place that is taken seriously uh, for doing this, though the, the, uh, uh, the law deans almost uh, to a person condemn them as misleading, as ignoring so much that's important, as uh, um, corrupting the process. Uh, um, and yet, uh, you know, all their, uh, you know, for, for a time they thought they could ignore them. It proved that they couldn't do it. Um, um, now the, and, uh, and that they, you know, now investing, you know, I increasing resources in all the different manipulations they can make in order to, you know, to raise the ranking of their school was actually out providing the kinds of services that they once valued or by, or by giving up some of the services that they once valued. I, um, so everything from sending thousands of, I mean, spending, you know, vast sums of money to send, you know, beautiful catalogs to all the people who will be, giving the informal, that is giving the uh, informal assessment, the expert deans and law professors who will rank all, uh, lots of other um, uh, law schools as well as, um, you know, getting, uh, manipulating numbers so that, you know, the 75th and the 25th percentile are good and you can below that too because that's what the, 
uh, they, what they measure or, um, or uh, you know, putting some people in, uh, in uh, evening school for a while until they get past the point where they're measured because they want it, you know, the different kinds of diversity indexes they're trying to get up and so on. So it isn't, that didn't even require you know, s s automatic state regulation, but just the prestige of the numbers which other way they know how to choose, use this one automatically, uh, forcing all kinds of corruption. Well, I, we fin I finish again mentioning the schools. Uh, you know more about these things than I do. I certainly, certainly numbers have a validity of a kind within specific kinds of situations. It's less clear whether, I mean, but, but, but different goals for education in different places might be totally legitimate. What sense does it make to make everybody fit the same standard, and even apart from that, uh, this, uh, that's even apart from the, uh, uh, the inevitable temptation to somehow, uh, you know, rejigger the program so that you can improve the numbers when everybody's paying attention to those numbers and that's what you're being judged by, even if it doesn't produce, uh, you know, skills in the students, that was what uh, people were hoping for. So, what's to be done? I don't think uh, that we can do without numbers. Uh, but somehow um, putting them in an automatic role, creating the situation in which the numbers themselves are made to decide, uh, uh, perhaps does more harm than good. So, and with that, I'll finish. Thank you. What's to be done is to change the screen. Um, <clears throat> I, I need to start first by thanking Noah for organizing this. Thanking, <laughs> I'm going to tell his kids that what an applause he got, um, and also Radhika for orga helping organize it, and Ted for uh, joining us, and me. Um, now I have to get out of my, his slideshow and get to mine. Um, I also have to acknowledge this guy over here, Andy Kazimias, who yesterday we had a panel for celebrate his 90th birthday. He's one of the founders of this society. And then for those of you who don't know, we went out for dinner and he danced Greek dances, which I could not do, but it was fun to watch him. So. Let me uh, preface what I'm going to say, and hopefully I have to do two things, work with this hand on here and work with this hand on here, because they're not coordinated. This is what's telling me what I'm, well, I'm not what I'm gonna say, but it gives me sort of clues, and that's what you're gonna see. Um, I'm gonna take you on a little bit of uh, intellectual odyssey, but it's also a political and, and social odyssey about methods. And what I'm concerned about, that much of what I see in graduate training, uh, but also when I go to meetings, is when they talk about methods in science, they're talking about techniques. And when they're talking about techniques, they're denuding it of any sense of its science, and they're also denuding it of its sense of history. And that's what I want to play with in thinking about the idea of methods. Let's see if I play. Okay. I. I think of methods as the way in which many people, at least that I hear and when I read books on methods, is sort of the answer to the alchemist philosopher's stone. It's the mesmerizing as the stage of truth. And with that, all right, we'll see what happens. Um, the historian romanticizes the smell of the archive as retrieving the past. Beautiful history about the, in the 1800s, the archive had anthrax, so what they were smelling was the anthrax, but they didn't recognize it. The social science romanticizes the measuring devices as retrieving the past, and that was when uh, Ted was talking about PISA. Uh, much of that is that romanticizing. Procedure as meth has become for many what science is, and I'm reminded of a movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, quantitative or qualitative, or the historian who asked the question of, did you go to the archive? That seems to be the question. 
What I want to argue is two things, that methods embody theories, and those theories embody notions of comparative principles, which should be very important to this group because that's what this group is about, studying comparative education. And I want to say it's sort of the way uh, also, see Ted, I'd listen. Um, Ted ended saying, you know, numbers aren't bad, but you got to be careful. I want to say methods or techniques aren't bad, but you got to be very careful, and that romanticizing can be dangerous. What I mean by dangerous, it disguises the theories to change conditions and change people as desires about the future without recognizing that's what you're doing. It eludes the political of modernity, it empties history in history, and it makes forgetting as the prophecies of the future. And somehow my thing isn't, this isn't going, but that doesn't make a difference. Okay. Again, I'm not against science or methods, but trying to understand the historical dangers of making techniques as methods and as criteria of professional competence. All right, I'm gonna start with a very simple uh, observation in a book that was written a while ago by a psychiatrist and uh, an anthropologist named uh, Royston Bateson. And they said in the very beginning, they do it beautifully in about two or three paragraphs. They say, you know, when you think about the way we understand people, there are only four ways to know about the human conditions. They say you talk to people, you participate, the participant observer, you stand in the back of the room, you're the non-participant observer, and then you read about a culture. You pick up a brochure in the uh, principal's office and see what they say about the school. That's about a culture. Notice they didn't include experiments, and even when you go into the sciences, you realize that when people do experiments, they really have to be very careful about how they do it because it's not about reality. So the question becomes, when you're talking about methods, is how you put these four criteria into use. What do you do with it? So I want to deal with this in four ways. I want to deal first with the issue of comparison and say it's with us. And Lynn Fendler was talking about this in terms of inclusion and exclusion yesterday at her session. It's about that. Because you're continually making comparisons, even when you don't know it. Um, the second is to understand how methods are theories that act on you. We, uh, we tend to think of uh, methods as helping to describe, but I'm going to say in, uh, in what Kurt Danzinger wrote in a book about psychology is how uh, you make the subject. In other words, it acts on you. The third is to talk about two kinds, and fourth, two kinds of discourse analysis, or one is um, one about when we talk about context through looking at qualitative research, and I'll do two examples there, and then look at numbers as how numbers also define context. And I'm doing that because one of the things that really goes unquestioned in a lot of the work I read is how people keep talking about context without ever thinking about what that theoretically means. So that's, and I'll do this very quickly, that's why I said it's an odyssey. Um, hopefully it will be, by the end of this, this summer, it will be uh, a text, but at this moment it's an odyssey. Um, the issue of comparison. Let me start with this very lovely painting, uh, which would have been modernized if you look at it very carefully. And um, there's two ways of looking at this, besides the fact that he's holding his iPhone. Um, one is he's making a comparison, and the comparison is very much what Berger, Berger, and Kelman call the homeless, I think of it as the homeless mind, but not the way they think of it. And what he's doing is looking at something at a distance and trying to understand how you understand the self in relationship to that. That's a comparison. And so the clouds become a metaphor for thinking about the self and the poet. And this is sort of uh, 19th century romanticism, which is very much related, by the way, to the Enlightenment, but that's another story. Put this next to this. Here's, and there's different ways in which you see it, but again, it's comparative. The minute I did that, you have another form of comparison. And the comparison could be on its representations, that is, look out, he's looking at the mountains and look at the mountains and the trees and, and the painting. A different way of looking at it is through another way of reasoning. And the other day I had a really, I thought it was interesting discussion for me because I'm very much interested in the idea of how this pastoral image becomes um, brought into social science at the turn of the 19th century, at least in Europe and in the US. 
And the pastoral image becomes very important when you think about the, the way in which early uh, sociology, for example, talked about the family, talked about primary, um, primary relations, communications. Embedded in that was to take a rural idea of the pastoral and try to urbanize it to deal with immigration and the, the consequence of immigration when face-to-face -face relations were no longer important. And so social science found ways of trying to rethink that pastoral image, but within the city. Um, another way of looking at this comparison to understand that it's not about the pastoral. The pastoral is the left. That has to do with European and American history, but if you go into Chinese history, it's not a pastoral image. It's a whole different relation of what it means between humanity and the things around humanity that's part of that humanity itself. I can't say more than that except to say it was really a very interesting for me discussion to realize that when I use the notion of pastoral, I can't use it. And, but they're all comparisons and they're different kinds of comparison. One is built upon notions of representation. One is built upon notions of relationships and non-representations about how things flow and move. All of them, though, are comparisons. All right. And here you can see another, for me, another example, and I won't spend too much time on it, except to say that the images here are not images in the sense we would use it in terms of trying to understand what's being represented and how they're different and similar. Um, in, and so there are different ways of reading. And part of the idea of thinking about when you construct methods is how you begin to construct ways of understanding that r recognize how you're understanding differences and what that, that comparison is about. By the way, that was the panel yesterday, I thought, the one that Lynn and uh, Steve Carney and Daniel Fredericks were in were really gave theoretical and um, empirical uh, focus to how you can think about non-representational ways of thinking. All right, so what do I want to say about comparative studies? Um, people have always compared as they've always remembered, all right? That's if you read the, uh, the chronicles of um, Herodotus and other people, you can see they were comparing. But they comparing and remembering, at least from the 19th century, there are in particular time spaces that have qualities of, I'm using Deleuze and Guattari here, a, a rhizome, because I like it, um, that become eluded to the reasoning of, uh, without having uh, reasoning when you begin to label things as non-Eurocentric indigenous knowledge or local from uh, global. The political intent of those kinds of phrases to me are important. The epistemological politics of those things need to be unthought because they tend to create a way of comparing that re-inscribe the very kinds of things that um, you want to get away from, at least I think, um, especially in comparative education. Okay, let me go on to my second point. Methods act, and they act in ways of making facts. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't facts um, but I am saying that you make facts. Things happen in the world, but you have to have some way of noticing them. To notice them is to make them into a fact. Um, things do exist, but this is not a pipe, but it is a pipe. And I want to, and I'm just going to mention this because um, there's a lot of discussion today about what is the new materialism. I don't know if this is the new materialism, but I am talking about something that is material. I'm not talking about constructivism. Um, just to position myself, or at least have you position me. Um, whether it works or not, you'll find out. All right, let me give you some examples of how methods act to, in a sense, produce particular ways in which world is acted on. Let me begin with a very simple example of American polling. American polling is an invention of the 1920s in political science. I'm not talking about education here. Why is it interesting? It's interesting to me because one of the things that you begin to have in American progressivism, which is, it's interesting to me about how educators write about American progressivism, is that you begin to have a breakdown of the way in which you govern through face-to-face -face interactions. The, the town hall of New England no longer is, is possible. And American political science pick up the polling as a way of trying to reinsert the way people feel they have an interest in 
society and are being respected for their attitudes and ways of, of thinking about things because the polling captures that as an institutional way of dealing with it even though the face-to-face -face relations are no longer there. Anyone who reads today's papers can see how that polling has become, in, in effect, a way of talking about what is real and not real. Um, the second example is um, the correlation coefficient of Carl Pearson, which is very much used in education if you do statistical work. And Pearson adopted this from Galton as a descriptive statistics for fitting uh, distributions of samples. Pearson was very much interested in the colonial process. He was very much interested in what was happening in South Africa in the Boer War and trying to prove the superiority of the British in terms of why the colonial system was a good system to have. It's not that you can't use this kind of statistics elsewhere, but it's, it was theoretically built upon a, a particular kind of assumptions to understand differences and compare that are not exactly what we think of when we use it. The last example is um, Bourdieu's notion of um, distinctions, which many people probably, I hope, well, if you don't know, it's what he tries to do is map out French society to understand taking Marx, but turning Marx into a, a cultural problem is how is it that distinctions and differences get produced. He looks at statistics, at least the regular statistics, and says, I can't use it because it's theoretically not what I want to do because I want a correspondence. And he goes and tries to find something which he calls correspondence theories and able to build this map of French society. Each of these examples give you, I hope, an illustration of how embedded in the very techniques you're using to, to uh, make facts to understand and, uh, and explain, but also what is desired about this society are embodied in these technologies that you borrow. Okay, um, now I'm gonna go on to my third one. You can see I can't count. It should say three and four, but I started back at one, but that's life. Um, I'm gonna take on this idea of context because I keep hearing every time someone says why I'm doing qualitative research instead of statistical research, they say it's because I wanna do context. And then I have a lot of historical friends who also say what makes, um, what, what is important about doing history is it provides a context where something like Pisa doesn't. And I'm gonna argue Pisa actually talks about context. So let me go on to that and, um, all right. Let me begin with someone who is um, Jacobotti. He wrote a book called Provincializing Europe and then he wrote another book more recently, The Calling of History. And to me, this is a very, context for him is the archive. He goes into the Indian archive and tries to understand how modern history gets constructed. And he uses the archive as a, as a way of talking about where the truth originates from and then provides interpretive uh, ways of dealing with that. And he deals with the way in which German idealism from Lanka enters into Indian society and then um, he talks about it a little bit, for example, how Hindu mystic categories of nationalism enter into the a way in which the Indians adopted um, the notion of history, but he isn't able really to pursue that because, I'll use what I said before, he's still into a very notion of representation um, and biography as a way of explaining things. And so for him, the context is the archive. The archive stands as what's real, and from that you develop interpretations about how the past became the past. Um, let me give you another one, which is to me a little different, and this comes actually back to the, seminar, the panel yesterday that I mentioned before, which is from um, Laura Stola. She's an anthropologist who seems to be doing a lot of historical work, which I appreciate, and the book is called Along the Archival Grain. She goes into, I gotta look at my watch. Um, she goes into the archives in Indonesia and says, how is it possible that the archive, what does the, let me put it differently. She takes the idea of representation in the archive and asks how it became res representations. And in asking that question, she also asks how you begin to construct and compare different kinds of people and in effect construct notions of uh, racialized people. And she says, the archive is a site of safekeeping, a place of legislation of language, 
which is to establish truth. Um, not that she's doing that. She's saying that's how it's, it, the British, is, no, it was the Dutch, how the Dutch established the archive. And then she goes on to say that the archive is a place to think of something that animates political energies and expertise. It pulls some social facts, converts them into qualified knowledge and ways of knowing, and produces social kinds, particular kinds of data for auditing the state commitment to the public good and to racial differentiation. So this is another way of thinking about how things get produced without necessarily using the notion of context as Chakrabarty would have used. All right, let me go on to numbers because hopefully I can finish in time, so if there are questions, there can be questions for, asked of all of us. I, my interest in numbers is very simple. Numbers are created and enter into social and cultural realms, and I want to understand what are the cultural and social um, organization that produces kinds of people. Because the numbers, and this is from PISA and also from the McKinsey, and this is related to a project that uh, Daniel and Sverker, which I don't see, but he wasn't, is here, there he is. Good, I was gonna test him. Um, uh, we're working on trying to understand how numbers are produced in these international assessments and how they are influencing what becomes scientific knowledge and how that becomes also political knowledge related to uh, state governing, but also research governing. All right, so this is from FISA, and let me just uh, very quickly, if you see these not as numbers, not ask whether they're accurate or not, but you ask what are the, the cultural conditions and principles in which they're being read. And for me, one way is to understand them is that it's the promise of international democracy. These charts rank nations, and then they say where you fall somewhere. It's like a GPS system but of nations and people. And then the idea is then how you somehow can um, develop models to change those societies so that they can get to the top. So the promise is some notion of democracy. It o and deal with also inequality, because you can see the inequality here by the way they're ranked and also the graphs, and the graphs become ways of sort of uh, indexing who people are and who they're not. It also is a way of taming uncertainty it, but with the notion of certainty. And what's also embedded in these notions is that there is a pathway, I'll get to that in a minute, to finding yourself at the top. Um, there's a joke once in Scandinavia about if you want to get on a plane to Finland, all you had to do is talk to people and you'll find out they're all finding, trying to find out why Finland is at the top and so that they can export it back to their country. Um, here's the model of OECD, this is a Swedish model. That was, they come in and they do this thing, here's the certainty. I mean, it's very hard not to read this as a notion of certainty. Um, and they also, not so much they, well they do also, but the McKinsey reports, which are about also the same thing, which also talk about highways. And highways, you know, have destinations and the destinations usually are fairly clear. Um, and that's your certainty. It's built into the modern notion of how these things are formed. So the very method of statistical analysis is not just about statistical knowledge. It carries a, a theory about what society is about, but also what's desi desired as society, but it also carries a notion of the normal and the pathological. And I love this, when I saw it, I was really, I couldn't understand how they, this would be done, but also why anybody would allow people to do it. This was a Swedish report that when we were having a meeting, um, it just came out this is a while ago, and there's Sweden at the bottom. And th what's so lovely for me about this is if you go to Sweden, you realize it's a, it's a really very interesting, modern, economically doing well. The schools generally do well. There are issues there as everywhere. But according to this, they're pathological. You can see, and I didn't highlight it. This was OECD highlighting it. I'm there. Um, now, you can say it's only statistics. It's not. If you read carefully these things, you realize they're talking about not only the, where people fall on this GPS system, they also talk about making kinds of people and also in it is embedded in a notion of what the society should be because in, in these statistics are cultural um, ways of thinking about people. For example, teachers. Um, in other ones they have, I don't know if I have it here. Um, yeah, um, in this one. 
Um, you can see they're not only talking about teachers, they're talking about every child, which also means that they have some notion of what every child is. Um, they also talk about who's not that child, um, the unmotivated child, um, the fears of the poor, the immigrant, the ethnic and racial groups. These are actually texts, uh, quotes from some of the texts. So you can see that it's not just about numbers. The numbers become cultural ways of organizing how you think about people and what they should do and what they shouldn't do and who's not that person. Okay, I'm almost done. Back to the future. There are no facts until you make facts. That's where methods come in. And I like Einstein very much in this respect, um, and probably other respects too. He said very nicely once, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use to create them. But if you look at most of the things that I cited, they're using the very categories that, peop that come out of the sort of the social realm in which they're uh, organized as a way of organizing what research is. He also said something else, and I'm, I couldn't find it, but I remember reading it. The most important thing when you're doing research is to ask the question, and then the methods will follow. And we tend to move often in the other way. And the final thing is this. I couldn't find the exact one. I went, I was uh, visiting a friend of mine in molecular biology, and his neighbor had, she had a, um, a cartoon. It was very much like this. It wasn't from Shudder. It was a, a scientist with a butterfly net trying to catch her question. And, it's a, and I said, well, why do you have that on your door? I sort of knew. She said, that's how I think about science. And that's not starting with methods or techniques as a way of engaging and thinking about both what you trying to understand, but also the issue of comparison. Again, the very, to summarize, to stop, actually, to say you, it's really important to pay attention to um, how we think about methods because they're not just getting us data. They construct and organize the way in which we act in the world, and we need to be very careful about the dangers of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ted and Tom, for two um, really inspiring uh, openings of conversations, I think. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start off with asking a couple of questions um, to you and then uh, throw it out to the audience very quickly. Um, Ted, you talked about uh, the notion of expertise, I think, that is tied, tied to uh, numbers, saying that um, there's nothing wrong with numbers in themselves except for the fact that they start to act as soon as you, you know, to, to, to have numbers is to have interventions already. Um, and that they really need to be used with a great deal of caution. Um, they frequently are not. That, that, you know, most people will see something different in numbers than, or put more faith in those numbers, et cetera. And um, Tom, you talked about, um, those very experts, I mean, uh, I've talked to a number of measurement people, and I think they are quite aware of, you know, some of the ramifications, some of the underlying, um, you know, assumptions under the numbers, but I'm not sure of if they're aware of the cultural constructs and the kind of context that come with the numbers, the context that the numbers build uh, in, in the act of trying to represent context. And I was wondering about the two notions here. Maybe there are two different types of expertise, um, and, or, or more, than, more than two different types of expertise that are needed to really understand numbers um, and, and the work that they do. And I wondered if you had a comment on that. Um, you know, I don't know how many kinds of expertise there are. I would just offer the perhaps counterintuitive um, possibility that in some ways strict reliance on um, you know rules of calculation actually denies expertise that is to say expertise actually I, 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 I see expertise where I see 
people in position of the right to, to assess, to judge, to interpret, um, uh, you know, well, what, whatever data, um, that, that numbers aren't the only thing, but that um, if, if, if uh, we have um, numbers uh, recorded, you know, rel uh, automatically and, um, you know, machines for processing them, then actually, well, I mean, obviously, uh, exper some kind of expertise went into the systems, and then, and then that, uh, that, that system desires to exclude expertise thereafter. And uh, so in some way, I'm um, defending some role for expert uh, interpretation on top of the expert, you know, uh, mach machinery of, uh, of quantification. I'm not, I'm not sure how to get into the, uh, I had a really, for me it was an interesting conversation. Um, Sverker and, and Daniel and I did a report for the uh, Swedish Science Foundation on these international assessments and we gave it to a colleague of mine in Madison who works with OECD and um, he's a very thoughtful guy and um, he reacted to the to the our report, but at the same, I talked to him one day riding up an elevator. That's how you talk to colleagues, by the way. Um, and he was saying, you know, we keep trying to warn people about the, these kinds of issues you're raising, and that's all we can do. And so it isn't that they're not aware of it. And again, it's also the way in which I think both Ted and I entered this is not to say what these people intend, what their techniques are about, but how do they become I'll use the word cultural artifacts, and how do they become read, and how do they become used, and how do they become, if I use the very beginning, part of the material culture we have and the politics of that culture. And it seems to me that's the issue that I think this we tried to raise here. Thank you. I'll throw it open to the audience now, and there's a roving mic. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Tom. Um, when you were speaking, you say that you relate somehow. Comparing with Peter Berger's The Homeless Mind, could you develop it a little bit? Thank you. You want me to say more about that? Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay. Um, in a book called The Homeless Mind by Berger, Berger, and Kellner, they talk about by technology and I think it was te technology and uh, bureaucracy as a way in which um, a new way of uh, the mind consciousness works. And, um, and what they, they argue is that what it allows you in, uh, is a way of thinking about how, and this goes to people who want to talk about globalization, how it becomes possible in modernity, and we can go into what I mean by modernity uh, at another time, um, how in modernity you begin to understand the self in relationship to distant and abstract relations that enter back into the self. So in that, the painting is a beautiful example of how you can begin to understand the clouds metaphorically as not only something in the distance, but as a way of thinking about the self and one's existence in daily life. That's a very particular quality they argue about modernity. My problem is the way they, um, you know, with bureaucracy and, and was it capitalism? I, yeah. Um, my, my feeling is that the general insight they have is, for me, was very useful, but it's very limited trying to understand it as that sort of two kinds of sort of institutional things. They're institutional theorists. And so for them it made sense, for me it doesn't make sense. There's a wonderful, um, Again, it's a few pages in a book about aesthetics by Jacques Ranciere, where he talks about what's the difference between the poet, uh, the Stoics, I think it was the Stoics, and modern poetry. And the difference is that the, in, in Stoic poetry, that quality of mind did not exist. The way in which metaphor was not there, it was a non, and it also was non-representational. So the, if we want to talk about globalization, going back to this, uh, your question, I mean, it's not your question, but my taking of your question. It, one way is understand the construction of this modern mind. And I say modern, a particular way in which you begin to take abstract relations and begin to make it as part 
of a sense of what it means to be human. Now, there are other things involved in that which they don't talk about. For example, the invention of human history is separate from uh, religious history and also separate from history of nature. The way in which, and this was also in Antonio Novoa's talk, about the relationship of spatial, spatialization and also temporal, temporality. Um, this is a particular quality that's involved in a lot of the ways we think about comparative research, and I'm gonna bring it back to that. So what the homeless mind does for me, is because that's what I'm interested in, is how is it we think? And think as a historical and social and political phenomenon, not just as Dewey says, how do we think? Does that help? Yeah. Okay. It's a good thing I thought about it. <laughs> Well, um, thank you, thank you both. Uh, my question, it's more, I think it's more of a historiographical question, so it's a question of method that probably requires a, a normative answer. Uh, you both invoked um, pieces, um, you know, whether visual pieces or texts from different, his, you know, histori historical phases. Um, so sort of methodologically, what is, how does that kind of way of invoking help us think about history of present. Uh, and the second question is more, is more nor normative. Um, are, are we able to think discontinuities in terms of how numbers have come to place, how have come to um, uh, uh, play a role in the, in the, you know, let's just call it neoliberal governmentality. So what are certain sort of discontinuities or where can we sort of spot those um, to, to, to think maybe differently about numbers at present, I mean, sort of current cosmopolitan, globalized, whatever word. Uh, I'm not yet sure what kind of answer to give about, uh, about uh, the, the first part of the question about historiographical uh, or what, um, um, I mean, I, for me, uh, you know, I mean, historians actually being, um, well, not in every respect, but in this respect, unreasonably humble, I think, tend to reach out for the, reach out for their, our, whatever theoretical understandings, at least invoke simple statements by theoretical people who usually are not found in history, and I think of, I, I try to bring it out into the open more, and to, you know, and that actually that uh, I see the, um, interpretation of a concrete, uh, you know, sorry, this is kind of cliched, but a concrete historical situation is in fact, you know, requiring, you know, requiring, you know, it certainly isn't just applying theory, it is may every, uh, you know, the, the concrete work is making theory too, and I, you, you may see I, um, I tend to develop my arguments through examples, sometimes as today it's very quick, kind of little abstracted examples, but you know, that you get deeper into it and you're still trying to figure out what the right way of approaching a thing like this is. So you never, you know, it never, it never, uh, the theoretical part never goes away. So, uh, um, um, and then uh, this very interesting question about neoliberal, I've become a little, you know, sheepish about using the word, um, but and yet there is a real aspiration. I put up a, a, a slide with, uh, you know, what, um, um, New Public, um, in, um, in, in, um, um, but I actually, I, I like to say also, echoing a, uh, a title of Bruno Latour, we have never been, we have all, um, we have, we have never not been neoliberal. That is a, uh, that is a, this problem of, of, of uh, you know, I mean, that Stalin, you know, you find his, uh, what I'm just gonna say, we do not think of as the, uh, as the great neoliberal, uh, and we find, you know, sometimes you find, you wonder, what did Stalin have to say about Lysenko? And you actually get, as they got in the archives, they find he's, uh, you know, he's dealing with it very, you know, very concretely and condemning all these people. So he's, you know, at the finest level, Stalin sometimes intervenes. Nevertheless, Stalin can't know that much. You know, no matter how much somebody wants to intervene at all the details, they can throw themselves into this or that. But in fact, they're always, if they always have this problem of coordinated decentralization, and anybody who shuts that down is guaranteed that 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 place is not going to last, you know, two weeks. Or you know, so, um, in fact. 
um, this, uh, you know, the relationship between the, you know, whatever, the, the dictator, the central office, the headquarters, and, uh, and individuals who have to, you know, figure out what this means and are going to combine something about the, you know, the ambitions of the collective, the firm, the state, whatever, with their own petty, you know, private ambitions and, you know, perhaps selfish ones and perhaps their own construal of the public good. That, in fact, is going on in every situation. That doesn't mean that um, that the aspiration, the particular aspirations of, you know, that whatever Hayekian, the kind of neoliberal doesn't, doesn't alter things. It alters, it alters things, but the, it's not, it's not unique. It's a, it's a solution. Um, it's, it um, validates a certain solution, and so it you know, call, you know, highlights a certain solution and exa and, uh, in, and heightens the, the role in some way of a solution, which uh, you know, or of, a, uh, of a, 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 an approach to a problem that, in fact, every kind of every kind of I mean, well, every political order and every business order faces, I think. So. Yeah. Um, I think of a method like a yo-yo. You know, you, you, I mean, ask your daughter. Um, I'll use this, but I could use other things. The question for me in my mind was, what do we mean by method? Because I keep hearing it in ways that disturb me, is because it's anti-intellectual, it's anti-historical, it's anti-scientific. All right, that's my bias. How about that? And so the question is, how do I respond to that? How do I think? And then you start inventing ways of thinking about it and then playing with things, objects, whether it be in an archive or whether it be in a book or whether it be elsewhere, to try to interrogate it. Uh, R.G. Collingwood said it, I think, nicely for me. I think it was him, where he said something like, What's, what do we mean by science? It's systematically trying to find an answer to something. And so, to me, that's a method. And then after the fact, you say, this is how I did it. Um, it's the same thing when I do ethnographies. I mean, it's really sort of nice, or even if I go in an archive, and I do do that too. I want you to know that. Uh, <laughs> you feel more virtuous. I feel more virtuous. Um, it's, you, you, you have these things, but what Ted just said, you have to learn how to read them, and how do you read them? It, and that means playing with what's there, and I, that quote from Einstein is very useful to me. You just don't take the words of people as the way, you, because that's what the problem is, how do the words get there? And so uh, um, a method is something you have to construct, and then after you sort of explain it about how you did it in a way that makes sense to people, and that seems to me should be reasonable to them too. Um, and that's what's unreasonable is the way we have it a lot, which is you say, here's my problem, um, and then here are my methods, as though somehow the methods are sort of carry the day to make sure that that legitimates that you're telling the truth. And so you have to be suspicious sure. of that way of thinking of science. It's a very technical way for me. It's a very t intellectually technical way, and it denudes it of all the, uh, I don't know if I want to use the power, all the, um, the, the qualities of understanding that should be arriving from this way of doing things by treating it as a technical activity. Yeah. We have another question. Um, this is, I guess, for both of you. You've pretty much answered the question I was going to ask, so I'm going to sort of uh, come up with a different one, a, a follow-up. So I was going to ask what your method is, um, partially because the method of inquiry that you're using is for both of you is so um, discursive and inclusive of all sorts of different methods, sort of the butterfly approach. Um, my experience, and I think that of my of students, is that if you wrote like this, and this, this goes to the how what you're talking about enters into the sort of discourse of the field. If you write like this or talk like this, you have no chance of being published or being taken seriously at a at a lower level, and so I guess my question is, I would like to tell my 20-year-old students to take the approach towards methodology and inquiry that you're proposing, but I'm wondering how it is that they should, how it is you conceive of them going about getting this sort of methodology that you're um, performing right now. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Uh, Um, 
I'm, I'm kind of uh, anxious because I won't ask that question and I don't think there'll be very much time. So it kind of piggyback on the, on the other question about kind of maybe like best logical, um, I don't know, uh, plurality or uh, what I, I, I guess. Um, but I was also wondering how do we challenge, um, you know, I, I mean, I've become anxious about the fact that I've been questioning numbers and in a post-fact world, I'm wondering, you know, am I doing more harm than good? Um, by <laughs> by taking away spaces, you know, or, or how do we preserve the spaces where we can actually challenge the validity of science without discounting science, um, or I you know, without giving an opportunity for those who might deny climate science, deny cl climate science, etc. I'll answer very quickly, and then you can. They're not doing. I mean, you had some quotes from. Uh, science and technology. Anyone who reads science and technology studies for me cannot end up saying that it, what you're talking about, that people are saying that science is science. It's just the opposite. And it seems to me that's part of the educated process of working with 20-year-old students is let them understand historically what sci how science becomes science and, and think about it in a way that doesn't technicize it. No, I mean, I, I, I'm not an expert on um, probably, you know, what your students are up to, and you have to find ways to adapt what you, what you believe to the, or adapt your methods so that they can express what you're trying to say, and I don't, you know, there's not one unique answer to that, but, you know, if you believe uh, that, um, uh, you know, that uh, a departure from the standard ways is necessary to get, you know, to get a better gri grip on what's going on or to provide a basis for better policies, then you have to try. And I don't, know, I don't think I will pretend to, to tell you, uh, you know, how to do it. Um, uh, this whole question of, um, are we, you know, are we criticizing science? I mean, um, I, you know, I uh, have been de defending, you know, the need for, you know, intelligent, um, you know, experienced, uh, you know, uh, educated uh, people to be able to, you know, then to interpret, and that has to be important. But some things are kind of some some things are. Um, well, I mean, nothing is truly simple, but some things are are well enough established. And I mean, I had a little revelation one time when I was sitting with my, I have a zero percent appointment in statistics, which isn't a very high percent. But I was sitting with my zero <laughs> percent colleagues, and they, and at first I thought a kind of admirable humility as they explained how. Um, you know, statisticians are always uh, are always needed for reviewing, you know, reviewing papers, reviewing r reports. You know, has the, was the the um, you know was the, was the thing carried out correctly? Is the analysis correct? And actually, they were extremely humble. My these uh, these coll these colleagues of mine. You can't really tell what's going what's going on until you understand the subject area. And as you know, the historian in me just said, you know, at first I thought I felt warm, you know, about this. That's got to be the right way, and then I thought, but there are actually, I even recognize, I mean, I am not, I'm only a zero percent statistician, and yet, yet I recognize flawed designs sometimes, and um, and then I wondered, and I still wonder actually, but I don't really want to, I won't name any names or anything, but there is a whole, oh, I know my history of science colleague, Robert Proctor, who, who uh, you know, is quite brutal in attacking, in going after various kinds of experts, historians as well as statisticians who have been willing to you know, to exploit the little ambiguity to uh, to uh, deny the causal importance of tobacco in uh, in lung cancer and a lot of other conditions, and uh, and then you find out that you know, I mean, so he uh, he publishes the names of all these people who took money in order to testify. So actually, now we also have this uh, the scene where, in the, at least in the American system, you um, you know, your job is to. You're paid by one side, and your job is to, you know, within some uh, rather rather supple bounds of uh, of uh, you know legitimate interpretation to make to, to, to support your side. So what, what we do have to be prepared to say somehow we have to we have to um, be able both to say that things are complicated, and it's important to understand the complications, and to say some things are after all when you've done it all when you've gone through it, you know, it's still clear. Uh, and some things are, you know, pretty clear. It's always good to have honest challenges, but uh, some things are clear and somehow so, uh, and uh, it's not as if, I mean, that is to say these experts, um, whatever, um, some, um, 
and they may have their own personal crotchets, but they may be in the employ of somebody else, they may, or they may be taking feathering their own nest, so the ex, you know, relying on expertise of well-qualified people by itself isn't, isn't, is, an, is not an adequate solution either. And sometimes, yeah, you need, you need uh, flexible methods. 